We're here at Mobile World Congress Americas with Dean Brenner of Qualcomm to learn a little bit more about the recent spectrum activities that have been going on in the U.S. and around the world. So, Dean, thank you for taking a moment to keep us up to date. And perhaps you could start by just kind of recapping all of the action we've seen lately around not just the 600 repack, but the first net and even millimeter wave accessibility. Sure, Sean. So, uh, just we're on a path here for 5G and also for gigabit LTE. Those are the two mega technology trends that are in the wireless industry that Qualcomm's leading the way with. And there's spectrum implications for both. So for uh, gigabit LTE, the fastest 4G service that uh, anyone can deliver, a couple things that have happened are one, uh, the FCC has issued the approvals for LTE unlicensed uh, for the equipment. And so you're seeing a tremendous rollout of uh, both phones and small cells, uh, all phones all using their Snapdragon chips to deliver the absolute fastest 4G signal possible and that's done by using a combination of both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. So that's sort of uh, trend one. Trend two is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for 4G, the FCC had their 600 megahertz auction. Uh, tremendous success. From a Qualcomm point of view, we've been able to commercialize the spectrum uh, more quickly than we've ever commercialized a band ever before. So the, spe the auction ended just five months ago. We've already announced the first phone with a Qualcomm Snapdragon chip, a uh, uh, phone from LG, and that phone also delivers gigabit LTE. And uh, T-Mobile is the first operator in the United States to deploy on 600 megahertz. So in terms of this progression towards 5G, we see sort of the 600 megahertz and that type of spectrum used for coverage, and then we see these high bands used for capacity. What's the right mix? Yeah, so we're, uh, the interesting thing on that, Sean, is I think we're going to see this play out. I don't think it's a scientific formula as to the right mix. The key from a spectrum point of view is to make sure that there's low, mid, and high band spectrum available and available in a steady stream so there's not too much, not too little. The operators have the financial wherewithal to both acquire the spectrum and deploy it. So back to my two mega trends, in terms of 5G, you will see a spectrum that's used both in the sub six gigahertz range and in the millimeter wave, the very high band spectrum. So what the FCC has done is again, the 600 megahertz auction has occurred. So uh, remember I said T-Mobile has deployed, they've deployed in places where the TV stations don't have to move off the spectrum. But in many places around the country, there are TV stations on the spectrum. It will take them about 39 months to move off the spectrum. And as that process plays out, you will see the spectrum go into use. That matches up pretty nicely with uh, 5G because as you know, our timetable for 5G at Qualcomm, we've pulled the timetable in by a year to accelerate the launch of 5G. So we're gonna be enabling the launch of 5G in the 2019 timeframe, the broad commercial launch. So then back to the spectrum picture, moving up, we have the 3.5 gigahertz band here in the United States, and it's a key band around the world in China and Europe and other places. You will see wide scale deployments of 5G there, and then up in the millimeter wave range, here in the United States, the FCC led the way in, with their Spectrum Frontiers decision a year ago. Since then, we've seen other regulators around the world moving up. There's really a race in 5G between countries and regions to see who's first. And we're seeing that play out in Spectrum as well. There's not perfect harmonization. So the FCC has, has moved forward, as I said, with 28 gigahertz and 39 and then 64 to 71. They also have some additional work to do. And it was great to see Chairman Pai here at the show announce that the FCC is going to move forward with additional millimeter wave spectrum. And then we're seeing in Europe and China, Japan, all around the world, regulators as well moving ahead with millimeter wave and also sub six. I have a few questions related to some of the things you said there, Dean, and, and first of them, what about global harmonization of spectrum? Is that going to be important in delivering sort of a ubiquitous 5G experience? So global harmonization is something that we always strive for in spectrum. It is a little bit like the holy grail. We never have attained perfect global harmonization, but to the greater extent that we are able to attain it, it obviously 
creates economies of scale. For 4G, of course, we have these very narrow slivers of spectrum, 5 and 10 megahertz of spectrum, little tiny slivers uh, that in some cases make up entire bands. Or a, 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 for 4G, a big band might have 50 or 60 megahertz of spectrum. So we have, for um, 4G, we have a thousand band combinations that we're trying to support at Qualcomm. And so now switching channels to 5G, hopefully, at least as it starts out, we're not going to have to support a thousand combinations and all those permutations. So the nice thing about 5G is we have these broad ranges. So for example, as I mentioned, in the 3.5 gigahertz range, which goes say from 3.3 to 4.2, within that and there are different regional and national differences but we have that as kind of a broad range then moving up to millimeter wave the United States has the 28 some other places have 28 but other uh, countries and regions have 24 to 27 so we have a range that goes from say 24 to 29 and then we have another range that goes from 37 to 42 the US has 37 to 40 China has 37 to 40 and 40 to 42.5. The FCC may add 42 to 42.5. So long story short, eventually we will have uh, all this carrier aggregation, all this band, these dizzying numbers of uh, bands to support, but we're gonna start out with these broad ranges, which does create the opportunity for a good degree of harmonization. What we do at Qualcomm best on the chipset side and in our R&D groups is we can project out the band's support that is going to be needed in the chips, and then we work with great urgency to provide that for consumers. Dean, you mentioned gigabit LTE. This has been just a hot topic. I think we're up to almost 40 global operator deployments right now in various phases. Can you help us understand the role of licensed and unlicensed <coughs> spectrum in delivering a gigabit LTE experience? And then maybe tell us a little bit about the concerns, if any, related to the use of unlicensed and licensed spectrum in a carrier aggregation type setting. Sure, Sean. So this is a very gratifying topic for those of us at Qualcomm. So several years ago, we looked at trying to develop a better mobile broadband service in the unlicensed spectrum. Qualcomm has a major commitment to Wi-Fi, a major Wi-Fi business, but there are some inherent limitations to Wi-Fi that make it not the best mobile broadband experience. So the question that we strove for to answer was, can we create a much better experience, better capacity, faster downloads, faster uploads in unlicensed spectrum? And of course, a benefit there is unlicensed spectrum is like a public park. It's available to everyone. Uh, in the United States, we don't have very tight rules. It's uh, considered for unlicensed spectrum the grounds for permissionless innovation, and we did just that. So we developed uh, License Assisted Access, LAA is the acronym, LTEU, LTE Unlicensed, and MultiFire. These are technologies that use 4G, but in unlicensed spectrum. So back to your question, for gigabit LTE to enable this very, very fast, exciting service for consumers, there isn't enough licensed spectrum for most operators to do that. Only 16% of the operators around the world have enough licensed spectrum to deliver gigabit LTE. So we went to work, we got LTU and LAA approved, first in the FCC, then around the world, and it's been a game changer, Sean. So today, more than 90% of the operators, because of the fact that they can use licensed and unlicensed spectrum, they have enough spectrum to deliver gigabit LTE, LTE. And what we're seeing is around the world, tremendous traction. So, so far, gigabit LTE using both licensed and unlicensed is launched in the United States, it's launched in Europe, it's launched around the world, and it's uh, only available with a Qualcomm Snapdragon chip. Well, Dean, I really appreciate you taking the time to bring us up to speed on all of the activities that Qualcomm is taking part in, in terms of bringing that spectrum that we need to deliver these gigabit LTE experiences on the way to 5G real. Thanks a lot.